tonight uh, TJ Kirk he comes to us from the the Freed Hardman area he has done all kinds of great things he has a several degrees uh, one a bachelor's in education he's been a seventh grade teacher everybody say bless his heart he's also been an administrator and just recently he was hired by Freed Hardman as the uh, vice president of student services. And I tell you, Fried Hardman has been knocking it out of the park with some of their hires, and this is certainly one of those. He is here with his wife, Sheraton. Miss Sheraton, we're glad to have you with us as well. Uh, and I think the thing that I am most excited about is I just I keep remembering his message last year, and I'm sure some of you will remember as well. He got up here and talked to us about the concept or the idea that there are some times where saying, I'm praying for you is not enough. I don't know if you'll remember that, but what a powerful, powerful message it was. And we just couldn't wait to get him to come back and be with us again tonight. We're going to say a quick prayer, and then we'll turn things over to Brother Kirk. So appreciative of you being here. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for everything you do for us. Thank you for the blessing of, of togetherness, the opportunity to come together in the middle of the week and just get our batteries recharged. We're thankful for... Uh, having a summer series like this where we can come and focus on things that will really help us. We're thankful for Brother Kirk being with us tonight. We look forward to his message. Father, we pray that you bless him and all that he shares with us. Help him to, to speak in a way that, that powerfully reveals your will to us and that motivates us to live our lives for you. We're so grateful again for all that you do for us, for the blessing of, of, to, of us being together, but also the blessing of forgiveness that comes through your son, Father. In his name we pray. Amen. What I lack is for love. When I'm broken, he is whole. What I'm doubting, he is sure of. So I'll trust the lover, the lover of my soul. 
See what I like? He is full of. When I'm broken, he is whole. And what I'm doubting, he is sure of. So I'll trust the lover, the lover of my soul. I sing that song because it centers me. It brings me back when life ain't great. Y'all may not realize it, but once we become Christians, it doesn't mean the road is smooth. There are some rainy days, some hard times. And there's some times when we hurt, and some times when my faith is not what I wish it would be. There's times when I doubt and I forget the promise that God has given me time and time again, and I sing that song, and it brings me back to remember God's never gone back on his promise. God always comes through. And there are times when I allow guilt to step in and break me down. Well, I allow guilt to consume me. So let me just go ahead and say this. Let me go ahead and say this. There might be a group of folks here today that what I'm about to say doesn't apply to at all. There might be a group of you who have never, ever had guilt creep in and, and just really crumble their lives. It's not going to mean a whole lot to you what I say today, but if you have been in that situation, if you've been in a situation where guilt has crept in because of sin, and, and rather than remembering the promise of God that he forgives sin, you continue to beat yourself about that sin over and over and over again, and you've allowed guilt to just take over, what I'm about to say is going to mean a whole lot to you. Because you may not realize it, but I bet, I, I imagine, there's somebody on your pew who's struggling with guilt. You know the type of guilt I'm talking about, that, that sin that you hope nobody free, uh, knows about. That thing that you did a couple years ago, that every single time you think about it, it makes you want to cry. It makes you want to hide under a rock. It makes you want to not pray anymore. It makes you want to not speak to your spouse. It makes you want to just go somewhere and hide because you can't believe you did something like that. I'm talking about that feeling. And if you felt that way before, like I felt that way before, hopefully you get something out of what I say today. I want to thank you guys for allowing me to be back here. Last time was a blast. I got to hang out with astronauts, right? Really smart people. I mean, like super brains. And I was all nervous, but y'all are cool. So it was like, <laughs> hey. I went back home and I was like, hey, you know the dude that invented that thing? I met him. You know the dude that designed that rocket that went up into space, like real space? I sang with him. It was, I was the coolest dude in Henderson. Just telling all my stories about all of that. I uh, recognized that last week you had one of my friends, Matt Cook, here. Uh, and he is a rock star, and he's working so hard for the kingdom. And I look up to him a whole lot. And again, I hope something I say today is encouraging and reminds you of God's promise to forgive sins, even that sin. Don't allow Satan to win by beating you down with guilt. Guilt is something that God knew we would struggle with. And I know this because he covers it in God's word. I love how the Old Testament can be used to illustrate principles that we need to learn from and grow from here in the New Testament. I love that I can read stories about Jonah and, and Abraham, and, and they seem like stories, but when you peel back a couple layers, you go, oh, that's talking about this. And I can use that here today, and so I want to share a story with you to help you see maybe what God sees when we don't forgive ourselves and we don't trust that he has forgiven us too. I want to take you guys back to the book of Genesis, chapter 42. 
And we're just going to look at the very first, the very first verse. Because in what happens here in this very first verse, we're able to see guilt in the eyes of these brothers. Verse 1 says, When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, Hey, why are you guys looking at each other like that? Why, why, why you guys keep turning to each other and, and making that face? What's that face about? And what he didn't know at the time is what those brothers, those sons of his, had done to their other son. And so every time the word Egypt pops up, I imagine that guilt resurfaces. What's that guilt about? Well, we've got we to go back a little bit. And maybe you don't know this story, and it's absolutely okay if you don't. If you look at Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 17, we're going to see some brothers who are dealing with some serious guilt. And before we get to that verse, there's a little bit of a, a, a backstory I need to give you. I need to remind you about Joseph and how he was sold by his brothers into slavery 40 years before. I need to remind you that even though he became a slave and even though he ended up um, in, in, uh, in the household, and even though he was lied on, he ended up in power. God made sure he ended up where he was supposed to be. He ended up meeting his brothers again and revealing himself to them, and he told them what you meant for evil, God meant for good, and I'm okay. I forgive you. He says those words. He embraces them with a hug. He says, it's over, it's done, it's in the past, Let's move on. But something happens, starting in verse 15 of chapter 50. The brothers said, it says this, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. This was a major mistake. In verse 16, so they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying, thus you shall forgive, uh, you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servant of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Why do he weep? Why is his heart broken? It's broken because he realizes in this moment, even though he forgave them 17 years earlier, they haven't gotten over it. They didn't believe in his forgiveness, and they are still in fear because of the guilt that they have in their heart for what they did to him. They said, what we did to you was unforgivable. So even though you say you forgive us, we really don't believe you. That's that one sin that we have in our life that we really can't get over. And so let's create this lie. Let's send this message so that just in case he still has hate in his heart towards us, which he probably does, he won't harm us. Hopefully you're making some connections in your mind right now. Before, before I get to the point, hopefully you're, you're kind of already getting there. But here they are trying to get out of this situation. They send this message to him, and his heart is broken because, again, now he's thinking, maybe, maybe they were just friends with me again because uh, they thought I was going to hurt them. The relationship that I had with them was love. I cared for them. I loved them. I forgave them. What were they in this relationship for? And this is what guilt does. Guilt becomes fear. Fear becomes lies. And we end up further and further away from the person who has who forgiven us already. Joseph is crushed. And he cannot believe that all this time, where it was behind him, it was over, his brothers were still dealing with this. Can you see a connection to Jesus? Can you guys see a connection to Jesus? 
to me, the parallels as I read this are just, just flowing out of my mind. Just think for a moment. How is Joseph and his life like Jesus and his life? Think about what all Joseph went through and think about what Jesus went through and see if you can make some connections in, in how those lives parallel one another. All right? You done it already? What's your name? Eli. Eli. Eli's already got it. Check this out. He was beloved. He was the beloved son of his father. He was the favored son of Israel. He was a shepherd, both of them. He prophesied his coming glory. He came to his brethren, but they rejected him. They both ended up in Egypt. They were both made a servant. They were shown to have divine wisdom. They were recognized as having the spirit of God. They were betrayed by their friends. They were handed over to Gentiles. They were both tempted but did not sin. They were both falsely accused. They both made no defense. Y'all see in these connections? Was cast into prison and was numbered with two sinners, two criminals. One was pardoned and one was not. Y'all seeing it now? We've got these connections that are here, and it's not a coincidence. It's on purpose. God needed us to see something here today. They endured unjust punishment from the uh, Gentiles. They were associated with criminals. They were regarded as dead but rose up out of the pit. Hopefully, we're able to see that this connection between Joseph and Jesus is real, and this story that we read about back then helps us today with forgiveness and guilt. So you might say how. Some of y'all, some of y'all haven't dealt with this, so you're probably still scratching your head saying, I don't get it. But there's somebody in here who has, and they're going, preach, TJ, preach. When we have this guilt that comes from sin, I don't know if anybody else in here has done that, but, but here's one thing that has manifested in my life when I've allowed it to get out of hand. I start to think that all the bad things that are happening to me are a punishment for that thing I did. Has that ever happened? You don't have to, you don't have to give me a nod or amen or anything like that, but, but for me, when I think about those things, I, anything bad that happened, I would think, you know what, I deserve that because, because I, was, I was a bad boy that time and that thing happened, and you know, I deserve this. And, and it, it really didn't hit me until I'm having a conversation with a woman. This poor woman, this poor woman was distracted while she was driving, texting somebody, and hit a child and killed him. It happened. She felt awful, obviously. Guilt, obviously. But three years later, her child was checking the mailbox. And a driver hit and killed her child. And she is convinced that this is justice. She is convinced that God is punishing her for her sin. She cannot believe that she can be forgiven for her sin, even though it was great, but God doesn't work like that. He's given us a promise, and we're going to get to it in just a moment, but I'm here to tell you right now, if you have that happening in your life, if you have that thing that you're, you've done and you can't shake it, God is not punishing you with every bad thing that happens in your life. God is not using this as an opportunity to throw lightning bolts at you. God does not work like that. He never has and he never wills, but the enemy will always, the enemy will always try to make you believe it. He wants you to feel that guilt. He wants you to turn from the Lord. He wants you to be angry. He wants you to be all of those things. But the things that happen in your life that you don't think are right or good, I promise you, it's not punishment. These brothers, they're having a tough time right now. They're scared. Their brother is the most powerful person in the country. 
And they've done him, as the young people say, dirty. And they don't know how it's going to end up for them. Their error was in looking at their sin and at the evil they had done rather than what their brother had said to them. He said those words, I forgive you. If you look at verse 18 of this passage, it takes another step. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face and said, Behold, we are your servants. If you've ever felt this way before, you know this is the next step. I think... all of their phones went off at the same time. <laughs> Man, I was that bad. Like, they were just... Man. But the brothers, still unable to accept his forgiveness, rather than accepting it and moving on, they said, let us earn our forgiveness. Because for what we did, forgiveness just can't possibly be free. Make us, make us, make us your servant, and we'll, we'll earn it, we'll work for it, we'll, we'll, we'll do things to get that forgiveness because you can't possibly mean you just forgive us for nothing. And I have been on my knees at night in prayer, making deals with God, saying to him, I know I did that, but God, I promise, I promise I'm going to earn it, I'm going to work it off, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read my Bible every day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve and I'm going to do all of these things to try to earn, to, to check some boxes so that I feel like I deserve or I've worked for this forgiveness Jesus says he's given. But again, Jesus doesn't work like that. He's made us a promise. Like I said, we're going to get to that promise in just a moment, but uh, if, if, you're, if you're living a life right now where you're trying to work and you're trying to earn your salvation, You can't work hard enough to get it, right? It's a gift that's given because he loves us. Joseph forgave his brothers because he loved them. And it's just love. And that's just it. And there's nothing else that has to be done. And I'm here to remind you that the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, Verse 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful, and he is just, and he will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Church, that's a promise. That's a promise. That's a promise he gave us because he knows we're creatures that if we didn't have this promise, we'd be weighed down with guilt. But he needs us to know that just like Joseph, he can wipe the slate clean even for those sins that we believe in our heart are too bad to be forgiven. They can be. Let's break this down a little bit. It's crucial that we remember that if in this is the condition. The result of it is he will be faithful and he will forgive. If we confess, if we repent, 
if we go to him and say, I messed up and I'm sorry, I'm going to try my best not to do it again, it's wiped away, it's forgotten, and it's not going to be held against you. He needs us to realize it's a promise. And all we have to say is, Lord, I cheated on my wife, and I know it's an ugly thing, and I know I shouldn't have done it, and I feel awful about it, but I need you to forgive me, and it can be forgiven. He just needs us to say, Lord, I... I cheated on my exam. Lord, I stole some money. Lord, I had an abortion. Lord, I fornicated. Lord, I gossiped for fun. Lord, I destroyed that person's reputation because of a lie. I did it. I know it's ugly, and I'm embarrassed, and I'm ashamed of it, but I need you to forgive me, and he will. He will. And it's so easy. It's so easy to forget this promise. It's so easy to go, yeah, I, I know he said that, but, but I hit my wife last night. He can never forgive that. Yes, he can. I stole from my mother yesterday. He can never forgive that. Yes, he can. There is not a single thing on this earth that you can do that will make him love you any less than he loves you right now. There's not a single thing on this earth that you can do that will make him not forgive you. And it's important that not just these young people on the first few pews realize, but even us old heads realize too because I don't know about you, I'm a new parent. There's a whole lot of guilt that comes with that. There's a whole lot of times that I, I lost my cool and I yelled at my babies. There's a whole lot of times where I didn't, I didn't listen and I should've. There's a whole lot of time that I, you know what, I was just doggone lazy and I didn't feel like playing and because of that I told them to go to their room. There's, there's, there's things that parents have It can all be forgiven. And I believe God intended this story of Joseph and his brothers. It's captured in God's word so that we can see someone who did something horrible. It's possible for forgiveness to happen, but to also see what it's like when we're not ready to accept it. But I want to keep going here because what First John says gets even better. Y'all, I had to read it a bunch, and I, I've read it my whole life, and I, I, I've missed this, but I need y'all to get this today. In verse uh, 9, John says, if we confess our sins, meaning the ones that we're aware of, if we confess those sins that we're aware of, what will happen? We're going to be forgiven, Right? That's what the text says, right? Give me an amen. Okay, later. Go ahead. <laughs> but what about the sins we didn't know about or weren't aware of? What about those? John adds this. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Y'all get that? When we confess the sins that we're aware of, we're forgiven, and then all of our righteousness, unrighteousness, all the, all the everything else, even the stuff that we're unaware of, is cleansed and wiped away. Now, some of y'all are looking at me saying, TJ, I don't know about all of that. I don't know of this group. Is there, is there any of you guys who are good in, in English, the, the subjects, language arts? Anybody kind of good? <laughs> You're kind of good. Kind of good? All right, I'll take kind of good. Kind of good, all right. What's, what does all mean? Yeah, yeah, I'm asking the expert, yeah. What does all mean? Everything. He says all means everything. Can we get an amen for that if we agree? All means everything. Y'all agree with that, right, smart folks? Yes. Okay. All means everything. Where, where's one of, one of those uh, uh, brilliant astronaut folks that are good at, at math? Isaac. 
Uh, they're at the Space Center. Oh, okay, they're not here. Are you, are you good at math? Uh, well, sometimes. Sometimes. All right, I'm calling and putting you on the spot right now. Okay. He said, all means everything. All means everything. If Johnny has six apples, and I take all of them. He has zero. He has none left, right? None left. None. So when the text says, thank you to my experts for helping us realize this. When the text says, cleanses us from all, which means everything, there's nothing left, right? Isn't that a beautiful thing? Isn't that a beautiful thing? If we confess our sins, regardless of how ugly, how bad, how heinous, how slimy and gross, no matter what it is, the promise God gives us is he'll forgive and he'll wipe away all unrighteousness. And I don't know about y'all, but that fills me with joy. It helps me realize that that guilt that I carry sometimes, that's not from God. That's from the enemy. That's not from above. That's from somewhere else. God does not want us burdened down with guilt. That's why he's given us this opportunity to be forgiven and have our unrighteousness wiped away. It's a beautiful thing. I look at Peter and Judas. And I think about their stories. And I think about how Judas allowed Satan to win. He messed up. But could he have been forgiven? Yes, he could have. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Everybody else ain't talking to me. <laughs> he could have been forgiven. Let me, let me take that back. God wanted to forgive him. but he allowed guilt to win. And then we have this brother Peter who messed up too, but he didn't allow guilt to win. He allowed forgiveness to win. And the beautiful thing is in Acts chapter 2 where he's able to preach the very first gospel sermon. It's just an amazing moment in God's word where we're able to see when we're allowing God's forgiveness to reign and to win and have an effect on us, how we can move on and how we can do beautiful things. You may not realize this, but there is somebody who wants to be here with us today. But they don't believe they can be forgiven. And so they'll say things like, I'll go to church once I get my life right. Or they'll even say things like, I've done stuff so bad in my past, God wants nothing to do with me. <laughs> Had the opportunity to take a mission trip when I was in college to Pensacola, Florida. And we went to the inner city and we knocked doors. And there we met a prostitute who invited us in, very nice. We opened God's word. and She said, if you guys knew what I've done, you'd realize there's no hope for and for the next hour, we open God's word to show her, yes, yes, there is. But she was so convinced. She was so convinced that she was too far gone. We didn't get anywhere in that meeting. Maybe we planted a seed. And maybe she came around to realize. But it breaks my heart to know that there are people out there who want what we have but because of guilt don't feel like they deserve it. And something else breaks my heart too. And I didn't, even, I didn't mean to go here. I'm not trying to step on your toes here at Madison because I know y'all are good Christian folk. Y'all would never do this here. But you know what? Sometimes church folks can be ugly. You know, I, I, like I said, not here at Madison, but there's some congregations where, where if a sinner walked in, they would look at them with disgust. They would allow them to sit on an empty pew 
and wouldn't have anything to do with them. As a matter of fact, that person would be the topic of conversation. And I submit this thought to you that maybe some people struggle to realize that there's a God in heaven that forgives because God's people here on earth don't. You say that again. Sometimes maybe there are people who want to be here but don't think they can because we represent God and we're unable to let things go sometimes. We want to hold on to things. Girl, yeah, I would talk to her, but back in 1987, she stole my man. I still hadn't gotten over. Back in 1992, he did this. And maybe we could do a better job of being God's people, living out God's purpose, and showing his heart through ours and our ability to forgive people and to let them know the love of God. Madison, I'm so thankful for this opportunity to be here and speak to you today. I'm thankful for the opportunity to have these young folks present. And I don't know if any of this is seeping in, but if you don't remember anything else that I say to you today, you guys are going to sin. You guys are going to mess up. You're going to mess up bad. And I know you might think, no, no, I won't. And your parents are out there saying, no, my babies are angels. And yes, they are. They're precious, sweet angels. I, yeah. Uh -huh. As a principal, I get that all the time. <laughs> all the, like I'll call and that just doesn't sound like my child. I'm going, well, he said it. So. But it's important you realize that in those moments when you mess up real bad, you might have friends that don't talk to you anymore that can't forgive you. You might even have family that does that. But the God you serve, the God you serve will never, ever turn his back from you. He is faithful, and he is just, and he will forgive. So don't wear that burden of guilt in your life. Don't let it slow you down. Don't let it stop you from coming to church. Don't let it stop you from praying. Don't let it stop you from opening your Bible. Because when you do that, you allow the evil one to win. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we had today to dive into your word. We're thankful for the story that we're able to read in Genesis to see how it's possible for someone to forgive a sin that seems unforgivable. We're thankful for what it represents and the fact that we serve a king who loves us so much, who is willing to forgive us on our worst day, who will never stop loving us, and will always keep us in his bosom. Lord, I pray specifically for the young people in this, this congregation. We all know the trials that lie ahead, the stumbling blocks, the temptation, and the sin that will come. Please never let them allow guilt to reign in their heart, and separate themselves from you and this church family. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your son as a savior. And thank you most of all for your forgiveness. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
Brother Kirk, thank you so much for that. We're going to take about a five-minute break or so. Uh, we'll let folks go get their kids in a few moments. We've got one more bell to wait on. Visit amongst yourselves for a few minutes, and we'll get started here at about 10 till. So you are dismissed.
All right, everyone. Let's go ahead and grab our seats. We are excited tonight. We've got several young men going to lead us in our devotional tonight. Elaw Alford is going to stand up and sing a song here in just a few moments. Jacob Davis, Kirk Hunt will both lead songs. We are thrilled to have David Creasy stand up and share with us a message this, uh, this evening. And looking forward to that. Afterwards, we're going to have Peter O'Donnell come up and talk to us a little bit about Vacation Bible School. Get us all fired up about that. And then David Wade will come up and lead us in a prayer. We really appreciate you guys all being here tonight. I do want to give you just a little bit of good news. I got word that Gary Moore's not triple bypass, but quadruple bypass surgery went really well. And he's doing well now. I just got that message a few moments ago. So we, we can praise God for that for sure. So Eli, will you stand up and lead us in a song? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for loving me and thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for saving my
Let's go share it. Not too slow, you know. It's a good, happy song. Uh, if you look, please stand with me as we sing. <coughs> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. devastating disappointment that left you questioning everything you thought you knew. If so, you are in good company. As much as I would like to have say my life has played out like a storybook fairy tale, I cannot. Um, often, there are chapters of triumph followed by sudden changes which tend to look like a roller coaster of themes. Life as we know it is full of things never would have foreseen. Does that sound familiar? When dreams are destroyed, we tend to restore the, to discouragement and begin to believe that God has given up on us or has forgotten us altogether. Yet looking throughout scripture, we see, the, we see time and time again how God used unthinkable situations for good and we can remain faithful. One that I think of is Joseph um, as he was sold into slavery by his own family. And, um, and then Potiphar saw that God had him in favor, in good favor with him. And, you know, he uh, also withstood the accusations of Potiphar's wife and uh, persevered through all that. Also, you, I think of Job, who, man, he, there's not much Job didn't go through and uh, persevered. And uh, that gives me a lot of, gives me a lot of hope because if any of y'all do know me, that's, I've, all of us in this room have persevered through certain things, and God is there with us every step of the way. And uh, amen to that. But a few verses that stand out to me, of course, would be James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking of anything. I mean, that just speaks words to me. And really, it all ends to me with Philippians 1 and 6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. David, thank you. I love that verse as well, because I think he's working on all of us, right? We appreciate you standing up and sharing with us tonight. Eli, great job tonight. Guys, thank you so much for serving tonight. Um, we are going to wrap up here with Peter O'Donnell. Where are you? He's the tall guy. Everybody, look at him. He's our VBS guy. I'm so proud of him. Look at him. He's going to share with us, and then David Wade will lead us in prayer. Thank you. So I'm Peter O'Donnell. Uh, as you all know, VBS is quickly approaching, and we are traveling back in time uh, with Marty and Doc to learn about the Bible, to save the future, and save people's souls. And just like that, I need everyone here to help us save VBS and make sure we're ready to go to have the best VBS experience in a while. It's been 
two to three years since we've had one. So uh, after services tonight, youth group, uh, we're going to be meeting up in Echo Room to go over some skits and talk to y'all. So if y'all can, uh, if you're interested in skits in the youth group, please go up to the Echo Room. And then uh, this Thursday through Friday, uh, starting at 6 o'clock, we're going to be uh, doing some outline and painting of the yard sign down in the Madison Room. And then come Saturday, starting at 8 a.m., we're going to be doing some more painting and some more construction uh, for some of the various VBS areas that are going on. So you'll be, seeing, you'll be getting a email blast, text blast, and all those things. We're going to overwhelm you, but please don't ignore them. Um, and please come prepared to uh, help and serve. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself. Uh, we have a slide that's in the rotation out in the lobby that has my cell phone number on it. So if you have any ideas, questions, or looking for ways to help out, uh, please just give me a text. And uh, just thank you all, all so much. Looking forward to it. Let's pray. Dear Father, we're just want to lift you up in praise tonight and, and we want to thank you for your word which is such a blessing to us and thank you for the opportunity to hear it spoken tonight father we know that that we sin uh, so so often but we thank you for the forgiveness that we have Father, we thank you for the salvation and the, and the eternal life that we have through Christ we ask that you give us a heart to carry this message uh, and the boldness to go and speak this message to to the world around us that needs to hear it we offer up this prayer in Christ's name. Amen.